On .NET Show today, I have Todd Gartner to talk to us about using Redis as a database for their .NET Core solution. Join us to find out how and why. And we're back for another episode on on.net. And today, again, we have Todd Gartner to talk to us about the amazing stuff that he's building with .NET Core. And this time, we'll be talking about using Redis as a data store for their solution. Uh, welcome to the show, Todd, once again. Nice to have you here. Thanks for having me back. Well, it's always nice to, to have uh, uh, you know, people are building exciting stuff with uh, .NET and .NET Core. And uh, I'm really curious to see what you have in store for us today. Yeah, so today I want to talk a little bit about Redis and how we're using Redis from, from .NET Core. Uh, if you didn't see our earlier episode, um, uh, we're building a tool called Request Metrics, which is going to be a new web performance monitoring service. So you'll drop a script into, uh, into your website and we'll gather all kinds of information about how real users are experiencing the performance of your web pages and your API endpoints. But to gather all of this data together, we need somewhere to put it. And because we're, we're trying to advocate for high performance web pages, we need our web page, our service to be super fast. And so we chose Redis to do it, but there's a number of constraints that we ran into uh, in building that. And so I'd like to, to show you some, some of that if I could. Yeah, and just to, to be clear, you know, as .NET developers, we have a, a vast array of storage solutions. We have SQL, we have NoSQL, anything that uh, comes to mind. And I always thought that Redis was a caching system, right? So uh, we have my SQL server storing the data, and they have Redis that is like super fast uh, cast uh, system where I can get the latest data for a specific uh, subset. But now you're telling us that we can use actually Redis for a full blown data store and be done with SQL, right? Yeah, mind blown, right? Like it's the super fast layer that's set between your traditional data store. But what if you just use that super fast data store and then everything is just fast and you don't have to deal with the problems that you get in caching and stale caches and missed caches and that sort of thing. Well, so you, heard it, was, you heard it here first, right? I mean, for me, I'm, I'm already mind blown. I want to see how you guys implemented that and how it looks in code and how the data store looks like. Go All ahead, right. show me the question. Let me show you. So this is our initial architecture of what we're building request metrics to be. Um, at the top is going to be a JavaScript agent that our customers are going to install in their, in their web page. And that's going to be what gav actually gathers the performance data from end users. We funnel all that data back to our service, which is going to be a cluster of Linux services. Um, Nginx will pick up that data and store it off uh, onto the file system. And then we have a, a .NET uh, uh, a .NET service called Processor that we talked about yesterday. Uh, and that processor grabs all those log files and chews up the data and decides what, what we want to keep and how we want to roll it up and stores it into Redis directly. And the whole reporting UI is also talking to Redis. So there's no other background store. There's nothing else. Redis is this key value pair memory or a data store, it keeps everything in resident memory and writes a copy of itself down to disk so that we can back it up. And so I want to show you a little bit about what this looks like and then some of the implications, both good and bad, that we have because we decided on this architecture. So mm -hmm. if we switch out and have a look at code, um, obviously, I can't talk about our whole data model because that might be a little too much to dig into, but I want to maybe show a good sample. So one of the biggest uh, or most important concepts for us is this object called page data. Page data represents a page, a URL that we got performance data from from one of our customers. So this could represent uh, Microsoft.com slash, like it is, it is the root page. And the things that we keep about this is we, we know about a URL and a hash. We generate a hash for all the URLs just so that we have consistently shaped data to do queries based off of. But the thing that we're keeping about this that's interested or that's interesting, we call the page performance period. A page performance period is for a given period of time, what are all of the counters that we want to track about this page? 
So we know, you know, what is the page that we're talking about? What interval are we looking at? So this for us will be a minute or an hour or a day. And then what is the start time of that period? And so that kind of identifies what, is, what are all these metrics for? And then all of our individual counters are things like, how many times was this page loaded in the period? How many unique people were loaded in that period? What's the total duration that everybody spent loading? What's the total DNS time that was spent? The total SSL time that was spent? The server time, asset blocking time, client time, page size, tons and tons of other metrics that we capture. And we decorate this object so that it can be easy, easily serialized. You'll notice the, uh, the .NET data member attributes. And because this object is going to be sitting in Redis and it's going to be in resident memory, we're conscious of not just firing in giant objects with really verbose names. And so we override the names of these things to be short codes so that we're, we're sending fewer characters across, you know, into the memory buffer and there's fewer characters in Redis for us to capture. And so this was one of the things that, that complicated our structure a little bit is that we have to be aware of the total data size and minimize that a little bit. Nice. Do you have any issues with serializing and deserializing from Redis and back, considering the uh, you know the size of the data and what have you, or something to, that you need to be aware of, I suppose? We haven't. Um, so the serializer that we're using is the uh, is the UTF-8 JSON serializer. We did a little bit of a bake off on on the JSON serializers available to us. There's the you know the tried and true Newton soft one that's been around forever. There's yep. the new one that was built into the framework under the system.data. And then there's this third party module called UTF JSON. And the Newton soft one and the new built-in one had roughly similar performance characteristics. The built-in one was slightly faster, but not dramatically so. Mm -hmm. UTF-8 JSON was dramatically faster, but it nice. came with some constraints. Like it wasn't able to automatically detect things as well. You have to be a little bit more explicit with it of, I want this name to go to this thing. Right. Um, like it, it couldn't necessarily suss out that interval meant interval if you, yep. don't, if you don't name things. Gotcha. Uh, so you just have to be a little bit more verbose, but because of that, you get a way higher performance, like almost twice or three times as fast as the built-in one. So, wow, nice. Yeah. So it was really, it was really, really great. Now, so here is, here's a, a particular structure. Now I wanna show you how this gets reflected in Redis itself. Yep. Okay, so this is uh, the Redis desktop manager, which is just a little you know helper app that lets me browse Redis and see what it actually looks like. Um, and here is a page performance period uh, as it's represented in Redis. And so if we look at this particular document, you can see it's obviously a JSON document and all of our short codes are in there. So this is a day interval that started on May 19th. Uh, there was one total count in it. This is a, a complex object that gets serialized in there um, uh, for a unique counter. Um, and then all of these other counters that we're, we're keeping track of, uh, things like server time, SSL time, DNS time, etc. This object itself has a complex compound key. So because it's Redis and because it's fundamentally just a key value store, I can't do queries. I can't say, hey, tell me all, give me all the page performance periods where this value is over this limit. I simply do not have the ability to do that without loading everything, which wouldn't be quite as fast. Yeah. And so when I want data, I need to know how to specifically address it. And that's where our, uh, our system kind of comes in. If you see over here on the left side, this particular document has a really complex compound key that for us represents is a GUID, which is like the customer ID, mm -hmm. the application ID, so like what application are we tracking, a P that stands for this is about a page, and then this is the hash of the URL. So if I want the page performance periods for a given application, I just need to know how to construct this key 
and I can fetch all of this data down at the same kind of performance characteristics that you would expect from Redis, meaning ridiculously fast. Like, right. I have this key, I can expect to get this response back in like five milliseconds. Oh, well, that's amazing. So how do we actually do that? How, like, where's the glue? Um, so if I switch back to my code, uh, the code that actually fetches these objects and does that work is here inside of page service. So for example, here is a function called get page performance periods. So this is the thing that actually will talk to Redis and will figure everything out, how to, how to go about doing it. Um, they're all async, async mm -hmm. task, which is awesome. This yes. is like, like, you have to kind of commit to async. Like once you start async, you kind of fall into this waterfall where one thing is async, the whole stack kind of ends up async. But if you just embrace it, it ends up working phenomenally well. For us to get a page performance period, it's really the hard part is just about constructing the key. How do I build this compound key for us to figure out what to do? And so we built helpers around that. So given a particular you know, application token and a given page that we're after, assemble a key, which is that long string separated by colons I showed you earlier. And then figure out what specific thing are we asking for? Are we asking for an hour at this particular time period or whatever? And so by building that, we can pull up a standard Redis client. We're using the, uh, the Stack Exchange Redis client uh, out on NuGet, uh, which seems to be pretty much the de facto standard, almost, of Redis clients out there. Um, <coughs> and then it's just about you know getting the key. So same underlying behavior that you would expect using this as a cache system. I just say, hey, give me my key, and I get the raw string. As long as that string isn't null, we can deserialize it using that same high-performance UTF-8 JSON serializer back into an object stick a couple of properties that we had to manually build, like the token and the page hash that we don't actually serialize for performance reasons, um, and return that out. And that's how all of our fundamental CRUD operations with our with our Redis system operate. It's about nice. build, building a key, get get me that key, serialize it out, and return, and return. Perfect. Now, I think that, I mean, Performance is great here. Performance is key, so uh, we know Redis can deliver on that. But as as a person that has worked on many systems, and there are certain questions that people will be asking, like, what is my disaster recovery with Redis, and you know, what happens if I need to scale out or scale down or what have you? So, how did you guys solve this problem? Right. So, if I have a look back back here at our architecture, uh, request metrics is going to be basically set up uh, as a series as a uh, two or three nodes. So there'll be two or three Linux servers acting as a cluster for the application. And so there's going to be two or three instances of Redis running, one on every box. Um, these ones are set up using the standard Redis high availability, as in one is the primary and the other two are backups. So one is acting as I am the lead authority figure and it's just firing copies of the data to the other ones, which are read only. Now, Redis is going to handle its own failover system, right? So as long as we are addressing the cluster, when one of them goes down, if one of them goes down, knock on wood, uh, <laughs> when one of them goes down, the system should automatically figure out, oh, my local Redis is down, I'm going to go and fire at one of the other ones, and it should elect, elect a new primary node. Now, that works for high availability. It works pretty pretty well for that. But it's not exactly disaster recovery. Because what happens if, for whatever reason, we lose all of our boxes? They, they go down. You can configure Redis during the installation to save a copy of its in-memory data store to disk. It's just uh, It'll just dump it into its own local directory as a uh, RDB file, a Redis database file. And uh, as it's going, it's going to keep that file relatively up to date. Uh, and so we just need to take a backup of this file. You can send a command to Redis through the Redis command line uh, to flush any pending changes out to disk. So once an hour, we have a job that will uh, call into Redis and say, hey, flush your database down. 
we make a copy of that database and we send it off site. We, we upload it to a third party service that is not inside of our own infrastructure. Because, you know, if we're, oh, yeah. try, if we're trying to have, <laughs> if you've built your whole life in Azure, your yep. disaster recovery should probably not be in Azure. You probably need to send it somewhere else, you know, Absolutely. in case, in case yeah. something goes down. So uh, we take that file, we, we push it off. And then in order to make sure that it's right and we haven't corrupted something, right? Because you don't know that your backup works unless you've restored it. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Immediately after we do that backup, we restore that backup into our development environment, which has a couple of benefits. One is we always know that our backups are good, right? If our development environment is online, the backup was good. Yes. And second, we always have real fresh data to play with in our development environment. We can look at how real things are working. And so that is an amazing like side benefit of this. Well, um, I wish I wish every every development system was like that so you could play with real data and up to date data. Yeah. But but it's fantastic because your backups are as good as your restores, right? And many people will take backups but never test the restore. And then they're in, in a pain in a world of pain when it comes to doing disaster recovery. What you guys have set up here is fantastic. So kudos to you for doing it properly. There's a couple of other cool impl implications of this. Um, the, the big downside that we already talked about with, with using Redis is that you can't just do a query. I can't you know, do a complex query and get data back based on a property. At least I can't without scanning the entirety of Redis and doing it in code, yep. which kind of defeats the performance. But as long as I uh, use complex keys to get at exactly the data I want, it's super fast. And because of that, I can do other things that used to be slow. Like for example, almost all of our tests in the system are integration tests that talk to a real Redis system uh, because I can just set up Redis locally so fast that all of my tests run super fast and I don't need to worry about mocking up a fake data store. So that's all great. Now, can I use Redis for all my solutions? Like if I have, uh, like I'm creating a banking system that I want to, to be super fast and I want to store like complex data structures and complex objects and relationships. Would that be something that um, Redis can be used for? You could conceivably <laughs> use it. However, sure. I think you are going to uh, quickly lose your benefits. If, you, if you're relying on your application logic to enforce those relationships and complex queries, you're essentially reinventing a smaller version of a relational database in your own code. Right. And if, if you need to do that, if your system needs to guarantee like ACID compliance and guaranteed rights and transactions and SQL querying and all that sort of thing, may as well leave it to a database that already has those things implemented. Right. Um, it, but if your application is is simple and you can represent your application as a series of very fast, simple objects, Redis is amazing for that. Great. So I learned something very important today, the fact that you can actually use Redis for, for a backup or as a data store for your .NET Core solutions. And it's, it's great to see what you guys are building there. I mean, um, just saying how simple it was to interact with Redis, it's, it's great. Thank you for taking time to show us what you have built so far. Thanks for letting me show off. Well, uh, thank you for coming to the show. Um, today we talked about using .NET Core with Redis, and uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you.